we got 10 minutes. Hello, Road of Forge. Uh, this is Michael here. It's been at least a month since my last upload, or our last upload. Um, the situation has been kind of interesting. We've been we've tried quite a few different configurations of the Road of Forge system, using stainless steel uh, deposition needles to guide the wire down to the rotating die. We've used stainless steel for the rotating die. We've used tungsten metal for the rotating die. These are a wide variety of materials. Um, basically, what what we've been trying to do is find a way to get material to flow reliably through a spinning nozzle or a spinning die at about 30,000 RPM on the brushless DC motor with a hollow shaft, and the, the feedstock material is a wire of metal. We've been trying to get that system to work reliably without jamming or clogging, welding, galling, things like that. And essentially, that's exactly what's been happening, is the materials we're using in the rotating shaft, the materials we're, rotating, we're using in the guide tube, uh, and the materials we're using in the die itself are all reacting in various ways with the feedstock material when it gets hot from friction and when it starts to become viscoplastic or more flowable, kind of like peanut butter does when you spread it on a toast. So this is a problem because most metals at elevated temperatures become quite aggressive, particularly when they're non-ferrous metals. Uh, aluminum, copper, zinc, uh, lead, tin, all of them are fairly aggressive and they tend to form intermetallics within their metals or they dissolve those metals in liquid solution when molten. Um, this is a problem that's pretty familiar with most people in metallurgy and probably with people who work with metal FDM or have been trying for metal FDM for quite some time. Uh, so, in, in general, what's been happening for us is that almost nothing we do seems to prevent the results. Uh, a metal wire comes down and presses against the back of a rotating die, the wire heats up, softens, spreads out, and then either contacts the walls of the rotating shaft, or if it is prevented from that... Ah, right, yeah. The rotating shaft, we have a die with a hole in it, and Essentially what ends up happening is our wire here gets shoved down into this rotating die and at some point it will contact it and this causes it to flash basically. It rolls into this potato chip or foot, something like that, uh, bullet shape, flattened bullet shape. It could be any number of things, but regardless of the specifics it tends to roll into this shape and these curls and the end of the wire itself tends to weld to either the guide tube that's being pushed through, so it'll stick to this region on the inside, or it'll stick to the insides of the die, or it'll stick to this inside of the die. And while it won't necessarily permanently attach, the increased resistance to rotation will jam our very small brushless DC motor. And this is unacceptable because if it's not, if it stops rotating, then the material stops flowing and we get an extruder jam. And so what we've been doing to sort of rectify this problem is digging through the literature and doing a little research on how people in foundries work with molten metals and work with hot metals in general. Um, and it turns out that there's a few different ways to resolve this problem that people in friction stir welding and in foundry work more broadly know about. Um, there are materials that are effectively non-wetting at elevated temperatures to non-ferrous metals. Some of those materials include alloys of tungsten carbide, um, TZM or titanium zirconium molybdenum alloy, which is a small amount of titanium and zirconium in molybdenum metal. Um, there are examples of H13 tool steel, for example, or ladle and casting steels, which are ferrous materials with relatively high molybdenum and chromium contents. Yeah, and I'll put links to all this information in the description for anybody that's interested in the details. But long story short, there are a set of materials that are well known about in industry with properties that are favorable for resisting the welding and galling and sticking phenomenon that we've been experiencing with our system and are used in very similar contexts. So what we've decided to do is go on McMaster, source some material for this particular application, basically quarter-inch rods of titanium zirconium molybdenum, which I'll also put links to in the description, and we're turning this down into replacement motor shafts for our brushless DC motors using a, a Proxon micro lathe. So we're making custom brushless DC motor shafts that are hollow, have a little hole in the middle, and the wire will be fed down to this hole, and then there's a small hole at the end of the shaft that behaves as the die orifice. So essentially the motor shaft and the die are becoming a single component with no uh, nozzle situation. So there's a motor shaft, there's a die originally, there were threads that held the die in place, and now what we're doing is essentially just a motor shaft as so, 
and there's a relatively wider hole that runs the entire length of the shaft, and there is a relatively narrower hole at the end that is only at the end, that has a relatively shallow depth, probably less than a millimeter, maybe a half a millimeter, something like that. And so we're ending up with something that looks essentially maybe more like this because the drill has a point. But yeah, more like this. And where this is a TZM molybdenum alloy material that's been drilled and this width is maybe 1.7 millimeters, maybe somewhere between 1.6 and 1.7, just slightly larger than the diameter of the wire feedstock that we're using because we want essentially the wire to come down to this section and when it reaches the end of the die, it has nowhere else to flow but out of that orifice hole. That's essentially what we're trying to do. Just hold the viscoplastic material in a confined space for long enough that it will extrude through the hole and nowhere else. And so that's pretty much what we've been up to, is getting material, learning about how it works, and essentially implementing it, turning it down on the lathe, figuring out how we're going to design the shaft, and figuring out how to most easily integrate it with the existing off-the-shelf motor that we've been working with the Zing 2203s. Um, so, with the, I, I, the specifics of why molybdenum are, or why molybdenum is anti-wetting with molten metals is uh, a little bit complicated, and I'll put some links to papers and other information in the description for people who are interested. But the gist of it is that the molybdenum has a relatively small atomic radius, and it has a relatively low surface energy because it has a limited number of electrons compared to other group six metals. Uh, what that means is that it essentially benefits from a thing called the lanthanide contraction. So the electrons are closer into the nucleus, and it only fills half of its 5D subshell, which means that the energy required to force the electrons around the molybdenum to form bonds with other atoms that may be dissimilar is much higher than you would expect for, the, for other metals that don't benefit from this effect, like sodium or iron, for example. Um, so, molybdenum both has the benefits of being in the group 6, so it's hard, relatively dense, and has a relatively high melting point, but it also has the benefit of having a small overall atomic radius, and so it does not readily form bonds with other metals, uh, particularly at the energies available to those atoms, or the energies available to the electrons around those other atoms at the melting point of most non-ferrous metals. Um, and so, this is interesting because it essentially inhibits the salvation of molybdenum into the melt of other metals, but it also makes it so that van der Waals force is the primary method through which molybdenum surfaces and the molten metals, or viscoplastic metals in our case, interact, which essentially has the same effect as Teflon. Uh, the molten metals will slide, more or less, along the surface with relatively low friction uh, and without necessarily uh, introducing any kind of chemical reaction. There won't be necessarily room for a, a brittle or metallic or something like that to form. So the, the details are a little bit deep to get into right now, but the gist of it is that molybdenum seems to be chemically favorable. We're going to run some tests to see if that's the case, and I have some, I've inserted some clips here uh, to show some of our tests using brass versus molybdenum with aluminum wire being inserted into a small hole rotating at about 5,000 RPM. And you can see that the galling behavior is significantly different between the two. So. Okay, we're inserting 6061 aluminum into a rotating molybdenum hole 1.7 millimeters in diameter and 1 inch deep, about 25 millimeters deep. Never you wait. Not in the hole. There's a lot sooner actually. getting a bit burnished, but it looks okay. Yeah. Hold on. Pull it either.
Yeah, it's just interacting with the edge of the hole a little mm -hmm. bit. But it's mostly clean. It's just some dust on the outside. Okay, ready? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Closely, we can see that it's uh, expanded to fill the hole, it looks like, or something like that, maybe. Maybe that's what's happened. It's hard to tell. Yeah, just grab it with some side cutters and see if you can pull it out. Don't cut it. It's I'm trying to pull it out. Give it a little pull. Yeah, it just pops out, huh? May I hold it? Still got a tip on it and everything. It didn't flatten out. It just got caught. It looks like it got a little twisted or something. Something's weird about it. Is it? Yeah. It's got like some twists to it. Is there any aluminum stuck in there? I don't know. I had to put a drill bit in there to find out. No, not really, no. Some chips, but it's otherwise quite clear. So, yeah. I don't know. I'm not sure if that's successful or not. Yeah. Looks like it got stuck more at the edge here than it did really at yeah, the base. Yeah, maybe it just caught the edge, sharp edge. Yeah, it, it's down there at the base. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty clear. Nothing in there. So, that's something. I guess that's uh, encouraging. It's it's sticking a little, but it's not like fusing to the walls. Like it's previous. not welding like we'd expect it to with steel, right? Yeah, like it's getting stuck and expanding, but it's not welding. Yeah, like I bet if we did this experiment with steel stock, it would weld inside oh, yeah. the steel. Also, I bet if we chamfered this in, this chamfered this outside groove a little bit, that would probably the help insert, a lot. Yeah, we chamfered it a little bit to give it a smoother entry. Mm -hmm. So is this encouraging? Lateral. Lateral. It may be a positive indicator, but we'll have to see once we've actually made the part. Temporary expectations. Temporary expectations, yeah. We'll have to see once we've actually made the part and put it in service. Right. Cool. So what do we learn? Well, uh, the aluminum uh, does not, at 5,000-ish RPM, uh, does not seem to uh, weld the inside of a molybdenum rod. Or a, a hole, a blind hole in molybdenum. It seems to catch sometimes, but it doesn't even really like swell and fuse like it did in the stainless steel or with any of the other uh, collars that we've tried or any of the other uh, shaft liners that we've tried. Uh, this just seems to kind of get just grabbed. Now, that doesn't mean it doesn't swell and it doesn't mean it won't fuse. It just means that in this particular case, we haven't seen it. Yeah. So what do we think the catching is? The catching? It doesn't I, seem to have much like strength to the, the catchment. It just seems to get caught on something. I think the catching is probably the local grabbing uh, of a deformation or a bend or something. It'll grab it. This is pure hypothesis. It grabs it. Uh, and then it, like, ju it literally just you know, works the material enough that it fills the region of the hole. It doesn't stick. It literally like, it gets jammed. Hmm. Not like swollen, but jammed. Like there's a sufficiently large component of the rotation, the force of rotation of the chuck that gets caught on the surface of the wire yeah. inside the hole, that and it's enough to break it loose of the grip of the three-jaw like yeah. drill yeah. tailstock, drill you, stock. Yeah, and if you look at this, you can see that clearly it looks like the surface is machined or abraded or something. Here, I can, I can put it against a, back, a better yeah, background. Put it, put it against something easy to see. I can put it against some white background. I don't think it's going to be easier to see on white. It might be better on darkness, actually. I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe? Yeah, there's something on there. I mean, 
Might have to take some pictures under the microscope later. Yeah, something is abraded. There is definitely some wear from where it was like contacting the, the edge, wall. the yeah, wall. Contacting the wall. Like maybe there's some change in diameter of the wire or something, or maybe the wire is. Like... The wi I think the wire is getting abraded. Yeah. Well, I mean, the part that's too large, right? That's abraded, or maybe it's the edge or something. Like, yeah, I don't know. We'll have to see. Okay. So we're going to repeat the experiment we did with the aluminum and the molybdenum, now with a 1.7 millimeter drilled hole in brass stock, using the same type of aluminum in 6061, that's 16 gauge wire, or about 1.6 millimeter OD. So if you do the honors, Sam, um, you can... There you go, we're going to see if we get it to weld. It's getting really, it's getting more difficult to push. Yeah. Keep going. I'm afraid of it. Keep going. I think it broke off. Maybe? I don't know, yeah, pull it yeah. away. No, it can't move. Can't move, huh? Okay, Ooh. try it again. Oh, you can't move it out? No, I need to take off the uh, drill truck. You saw the aluminum wire spinning? It was spinning briefly and then stopped. It, it has not been spinning very much at all, if at all. Okay. I was saying it's like it just it won't move. Like, I think, I think it's done the job. I think so. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah, maybe it has. Sorry. Then again, we are doing bad science right now. Is this bad science? We have an expectation of something, and we are trying to make that expectation happen. This is engineering. It's an engineering test. So, uh, sorry, scientists in the audience. Please uh, forgive our lack of a hypothesis and lack of a scientific question. Um, we're just trying to see if what we expect to happen actually does. We're verifying our intuitions. Hmm. It, well... It welded... Mm, I don't know. There's actually some open space if you look at the back. So it, the back it, side. it didn't weld inside the back side. It might have just welded at the contact point. But yeah, maybe or maybe it's just stuck. <laughs> Why don't we uncheck the brass bit and see if we can actually just get it out? Yeah, yeah just see if we can look at it. I wonder if anything extruded out of the other end. This was the open one, so yeah, this was the good piece. It may have. Oh shoot! Well, it may have actually extruded. It's okay. Are you alright? I'll do it. Press my knuckles. Oh no, it's definitely stuck in there. <laughs> Fascinating. Oh. I didn't even have a hole to escape through, it just didn't get out. Mm, actually, if you look at it, it might have started to go through it. We'll get some images of this on the microscope, especially down the bore, and take a look. Can I look at it? You sure? Of course. Thank you. Oh, yeah, there's some aluminum in there. Yeah, I can see the, the end of it, the kind of like mm -hmm. plasticized, maybe. It's really, really hard to see in this lighting because mm -hmm. our apartment is very dark. Um, we'll get some images of it in the microscope. Yeah, we'll look at it under the microscope. It looks a little bit like a firecracker. <laughs> Kind of weird. Hmm. Without further ado, thanks a lot for your time, and uh, I, I'll see you on the flip side.